All right, Chase Thomas Podcast, we're back. Jake Liscow, Lis- is that how you pronounce your last name? Probably should have asked that before we got started here, Jake, but we've got so much bingo stuff to talk about. I'm so excited because we were going to try and make this work this week. Um, I mean, I guess we could have done it next week potentially because the Bengals do have another week to go before they are in the Super Bowl. Does that sentence just sound real to you? Does that sentence sound right that the Cincinnati Bengals are playing in the Super Bowl in a week and a half? Yeah, it's gotten there. It didn't at first, you know, it took a little yeah. bit of time as somebody who's been following this team my entire life at 33 mm-hmm. years old, born in 1988, the last time the Bengals were in a Super Bowl. So, oh, wow, it's, it's been a while, but it's not as surreal now as it was at this point for me. It's actually it's kind of two ways. On the one hand, it's bizarre, like the photos on, on Thursday of of SoFi Stadium with the Bengals end zone that the photos of the Bengals with their their Super Bowl patch on their jersey those things are kind of cool they they hit you a little bit they're surreal moments but then it's kind of crazy how much it just feels like another football game too yeah and 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 for the first time I think I I really understand when players are talking about this stuff they're like yeah it's just another game there's Mm. obviously like more at stake in a game like this but I'm starting to understand where they're coming from I just, it's funny because I, I want to get your perspective on what you thought about this team coming into this year, because I remember uh, Evan and I on our Monday NFL show, we were, when we were doing the previews for the AFC North and something I said before the season where I was like, I just, I'm not a Pittsburgh believer. There's still something weird with Baltimore, uh, the Browns, they have all the hype. They're the best team on paper in this division. But there is something to be said where I'm like, I, I think Joe Burrow is probably next up because we were going back and forth and he's a big Justin Herbert guy and I'm, I'm a big Joe Burrow guy and I've been a big Joe Burrow guy for, for years now and seeing what he's doing is pretty cool and also something that I, I kind of saw coming and this is something that like I had Dave Damshek on uh, earlier and we talked about this where it's like the two to five year window is how you win Super Bowls now is like you get the franchise quarterback, he's on a rookie deal. You surround him with the right kind of pieces, a bunch of talent that makes his life easier. And lo and behold, you won a Super Bowl. It was the Russell Wilson method. And you see that, I mean, even just Jared Goff with the Rams before this. Um, you try and maximize that window while before you pay this guy. Um, I don't think the Bengals are going to have that problem with Joe Burrow. I think he's going to be good with or without uh, the big payday. Uh, but it is interesting because I was like, I love them in 11 personnel. I don't hate this defense. I like the Hendrickson swap. I... I just, it makes sense to me. Like getting Jonah Williams back should help. Like a lot of people just missed that their first round offensive tackle was gone last year. And Joe Burrow is doing all of this with a bad offensive line. Um, Joe Mixon, who Zach Taylor is like, it's happening. Joe Mixon is the vegetable that uh, no defense wants. No Bengals fan, I guess, wants at the middle. Like the amount of times I just shot it, I'm like, oh, they're doing another zone. Okay, outside zone for Joe Mixon. All right, let's see if this one gets for more than two yards. But you have the 11 personnel with Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, and Jamar Chase. And that's really hard to stop with Joe Burrow, who rarely makes mistakes, who remains calm and is just an absolute delight to watch. And I know I'm throwing a lot at you there, but I'm just excited because I I could have like I felt I feel a little bit vindicated for longtime listeners of this podcast that I was a Bengals believer before this season. Were you? You know, I thought that this might be a rough year. You're right. the, The two to five year window is what it would normally be. The the wrench in it for me was a lot of new pieces on defense is, is one of there's, there's multiple wrenches, I guess the, the first is the multiple new pieces on defense. Turns out they all hit and they all fit together really well. That doesn't happen very often. It's not very mm-hmm. often you, you bring in a Trey Hendrickson, a Chidobe Abuzier, a Mike Hilton, a Eli Apple to add to, your previous year free agents in in DJ Reader Von Bell, and you trade for BJ Hill, you sign Larry Ogunjobi. That's that's eight guys, right? Eight guys mm. that are free agents that are playing significant roles or starting on defense. It's not very often that you sign eight guys and they hit mm. and they and they fit together. So that was a big question mark, and they've come up huge in the playoffs. Obviously, they have been very opportunistic and and have maximized those opportunities. The other thing was Joe Burrow coming off the knee. I had a lot of confidence that Joe Burrow coming off the knee would eventually get back to the point where he was. 
And in preseason podcasts that I did when I was a guest on other people's show, when we were talking about it on Lockdown Bengals, it was a lot of confidence in Joe Burrow because he's an incredibly hard worker. He has that work ethic. He has that drive. He has that competitive spirit that if anyone's going to come back from that injury in a timely fashion, a quarterback, you would think it would be him. But it was a it was a complicated injury, right? It's ACL, MCL, other structural damage that we don't really know about. We actually don't know the, the full extent of the damage. It, it never really went public. Hmm. And so there were some questions like, is Joe Burrow going to be himself? Or how long will it take for Joe Burrow to feel like himself? And it turns out it took them until about week eight, hmm. week nine, week 10, around the bye for Joe Burrow to start looking like LSU Burrow. So and, what do you mean by that? What did you see? What flipped? So for the folks who watched yeah. early and after, like what did you see that told you, okay, he's back? So so there's a couple things. One is the way the coaches treated the game plans. They, they mm-hmm. were a lot more conservative early in the year, I would say, although some of the running on first, second down came back, mm-hmm. uh, especially against the Chiefs. There, there were many, many first down runs in that game that, as you mentioned, didn't go for, for a ton of yards until overtime. Yeah, and then, and then Joe Mixon ripped a couple off that got them into easy field goal range. Not that Evan McPherson needed the help, but we can right. come back to that. But um, the the game plan seemed like they were really trying to protect Burrow. Their their neutral pass rate, which is you know first second down score within seven points or something like that on early downs, was was pretty low compared mm. to the rest of the NFL. Like a very low frequency passing team, which compared to the previous year for Zach Taylor, one of the one of the most pass-happy teams in the NFL in mm-hmm. 2020 when Joe Burrow gets hurt. After And the other thing is Joe Burrow can't, can't evade guys in the pocket. And that's when I was concerned. I was like, ooh, has that part of his game been diminished by this injury? Early in the year, you saw him doing this little spin move that didn't work when he got pressure. You mm-hmm. see him try to spin out of it, and he would just get sacked. He didn't have that that short area burst that he had when he was healthy because he's a good athlete and he and he looked kind of like a, a pedestrian athlete mm-hmm. early on. And and he was still good. Not not to say he wasn't good. He only really had like three bad games this year at mm-hmm. quarterback. Uh the inflation the the uh the interception numbers I think are very inflated, but it, it didn't look like LSU Joe Burrow. It didn't look like the Joe Burrow who looked like he was going to save the Bengals franchise. Now after the buy, especially against San Francisco, I would say you see that LSU burrow pocket evasiveness and awareness and movement come back in a big way. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's when it was like, okay, Joe burrow feels better. And then you started to see the kid gloves come off in terms of the way they handled the offense, especially after that San Francisco game where Zach Taylor, after the game admits regrets about running the ball on first and second down in overtime or in the mm-hmm. fourth quarter or whenever that was, I can't actually remember. And, and then after that, it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to ride Joe's arm until it falls off is mm-hmm. what one of the coaches said. Uh, and, and they've mostly done that. They've, they found themselves, I think limited in the playoffs. And this is what's going to be very interesting going into the Super Bowl: is how does the offense adapt this week? Because against, against the Raiders, I would say they ran more or less their normal offense against the Titans. Joe Burrow's average depth of target under five yards. Mm-hmm. And in the regular season, I think his average depth of target is like the deepest or second deepest or near the top of the league. And hmm. so against the Titans, the pressure's coming so fast and they know they can't block it. And they and, and Joe Burrow is also a little bit confused that game from what he's seeing from Mike Vrabel's unit. Everything's coming out quick and short. Or he's taking sacks nine times. Against the Chiefs, came back a little bit. But they had another week of pressure issues. The difference was is that Joe Burrow wasn't as confused from what he was getting on the back end, so he was a little bit more decisive. And it was where the pressure was coming from. It was pretty much just Chris Jones. There, there was some pressure, obviously, from other players on the Kansas City defensive line. But it was Opening mostly just was getting there a little bit. Yeah, it was mostly just one guy. Yeah. Instead of everybody getting to him for, mm-hmm. in, in the Tennessee game, right? And so he's he's making Chris Jones miss, making key runs after breaking out of sacks, making throws after getting out, out of sacks. And that's what the LSU Joe Burrow looks like. Yeah. Is, is second half Joe Burrow against the Chiefs, extending plays, making plays with his legs, and and creating for you outside of structure in a way that you don't see very many guys do in the NFL. And that's what's so special about him. On top of his mental processing and his football acumen and his accuracy and his 
mental fortitude and his will to win and all these things. It's the ability to extend and create outside of structure. Yeah. And I think it, it's amazing because he was finding even these small zones. If you go back and watch it and look at the all 22, like every T Higgins catch. And he had like, I think three catches over 15 yards in this game. And he had some big ones over the middle. Uh, Oak Ridge is own T Higgins. Shout out to my guy. But um, he was a, he was just so good over the middle. And he was so important for that game because you lose CJ Ozoma. Um, Tyler Boyd was pretty quiet most of the day. The screen stuff worked for the most part, unless he got like, that's granted uh, Samaj P. Ryan uh, knows which way to go. Um, that's always a hit or miss. It could be a touchdown or it could go the wrong way. You never know with him. It's a, <laughs> you never know. But um, it's interesting because like if you had to tell yourself or you were telling Bengals fans on Lockdown Bengals, you're like, hey, here's what we need to do to win. If th- if X happens, we cannot win this football game. I imagine something that you would have thrown out is like, if Jamar Chase is taken away from this game and they do not allow him to do anything, um, I'm not feeling great about our chances. And that's how it looked early on when they go down multiple scores and the Chiefs go up, they score three touchdowns in their first three drives. You're like, oh man, if Jamar Chase is not there over the top and the big play stuff, the yak stuff is not there. I don't know how they can make up that ground, but cool, calm, collected Joe Burrow. He's like, it's fine. I'm going to scramble on third down. I'm going to find some AJP run on the screen. I'm going to take my time. The defense is going to bend, not break. And we're going to do this. Um, did you see that scenario being a possibility against the Chiefs on the road in the AFC title game that if Jamar Chase was taken out of it for the most part, that you could still win? Yeah, I, I did. Okay. Believe it or not. I, I did think that was possible because they've won games where Jamar was relatively quiet and he still mm-hmm. was productive. It's not like he was totally shut out of the game. I mean, he had the goal line feign, but it wasn't just like the yak, the 200 plus yards. It wasn't the takeover to get them back in the game or anything. It wasn't the takeover, but he did have a couple first downs. He had the mm-hmm. touchdown and, and he was a contributor. But the thing is with the Bengals is the T Higgins is also a number one receiver on mm-hmm. a lot of teams in the NFL. And, and because he's on the same team as Jamar Chase, because he's plays for the Cincinnati Bengals, I don't think maybe as many people know about T Higgins as, as, as otherwise could. Yeah. And so, you know, going into this game it was like, okay, it might be a T Higgins game, mm-hmm. but, but the bigger thing for me was which version of Patrick Mahomes are you going to get? Yeah. You're going to get playoff buzzsaw Patrick Mahomes, which you did for a half, or are you going to get regular season Patrick Mahomes who has some, some chinks in the armor? And you got that in the second half in a big way. Yeah. I think it was like the, the, the biggest gap in EPA per play from the first half to second half, biggest gap in QBR from a first half to a second half where he was nearly perfect in the first half and nearly, you know, imperfect in the second half went from yeah. like 98 to 1.2 or something. Don't tell Tony Romo yeah. that don't tell they wanted him to Romo. score. They wanted him to score. Wanted to let him score. Yeah, like that was like a whole thing where he's like, just let the Chiefs get in there. It was like, are you watching the same game I am? This is not the Bills game. That was something I written down in my notes. Like I'm taking it. I'm like, this is not the same Patrick Mahomes. There, yeah. like, there's no way. Were you thinking that? What were what was going through your mind during that last drive? There was one play where I was like, maybe let him score here. One play okay. with, with a play? minute with a minute thirty left. Okay. On that play, because then because then you have a minute thirty to go get a touchdown. After that play, it was like, okay, now you can't do it anymore because clock is running. But, but it's also like that's not how y'all play. Like no, that's not it, how the Bengals play at all. It's also something they would never do. It was right. like it wasn't so much a thought as it was like maybe this is where you do it if you're going mm-hmm. to do it. Was was more of what it was. I think my tweet at the time was like, "Oh no, we're gonna have to have let them score. We're gonna have to have the let them score discourse again this week." Yeah. And then it was, "Oh no, we're gonna have to have the overtime discourse again this week." And we we didn't have to do either of those because the Bengals defense stepped up. But there there was a feeling for me, honestly, there was a feeling for me of inevitability mm. of Patrick Mahomes. Just and, and I think the Chiefs thought this too. And that might, you know, I don't know how much you can read into to the psychology of professional athletes, but maybe that's a problem for them. And and it's been speculated that Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes were playing cocky, and they just were like, "Oh yeah, it's gonna happen." Oh yeah, he, you know, he's he, it's a three man rush. He has all day. He yeah. can find the guy and then he gets sacked on two straight plays. And so, you know, credit Lou Anaruma and the defense for making that adjustment going to that, you know, that, that drop eight, it's not really drop eight. They were dropping seven and they had a spy a lot of the time, but what was really impressive to me about the defense chase was that they, they, they were, they were going coverage heavy, right? Like they didn't blitz a lot of times they only rushed three and then they were playing single high behind it. 
and, and they're playing single high with with uh you know with a poacher on the other side to take the crossers they're playing single high with a robber they're playing single high with with two rats sometimes uh two two guys kind of playing those intermediate hook curl areas and, and carrying vertical stuff to make sure it's passed off and bracketed and for whatever reason Andy Reid and they played on Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes tendency to throw the ball because they're also outgapped. Mm -hmm. If if the Chiefs decided to stick with the running game, they were they were averaging what six yards a carry? Yeah. Something like that. They, yeah. they had like McKinnon two was successful early. runs in the game. Yeah. Yeah. McKinnon was moving. And 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 then the Lou Anaruma on the Bengals defense says, You're not going to run the ball, especially mm -hmm. in a tight game. You're going to put it in, in your superstar quarterback's hands. And then Patrick Mahomes was just lost. On the yeah. BJ Hill pick, he was lost. He forced the ball. He should have turfed it. He tries to fit it in because he's Patrick Mahomes, and that's what he does. And and BJ Hill picks off a Patrick Mahomes fastball from five yards away. Incredible play. Tries to force it later in the game to his superstar wide receiver, Tyreek Hill. And and Jesse Bates makes a, a great play. Von Bell's there to clean it up. And so the, the thing for Lou Anarumo is, I, I don't know if this works every time. People are going to say, oh, the Bengals have, have the blueprint here to stop the Chiefs. I don't think it's that simple. Uh, I think it's that in this game, he took advantage of tendencies and, and had Patrick Mahomes seeing ghosts and was confused. And, and that was a big reason that the defense was able to do what it did in the second half with the six straight stops. Have you, have you dove into the matchup with the Rams at all yet? How much have you deep dived into that yet? I wouldn't say it's a deep dive, but yeah. you know, there, there's some very obvious matchups to, to talk about. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you what do you think of the matchups to watch without doing the the full full analysis that you still got time for? Like what stands out to you? Because I'm sure the national discourse will be Von Miller, Aaron Donald against this Bengals offensive line and Joe Burrow having the time needed to get Jamar Chase and uh, T Higgins the ball. But I don't know. I think it's going to be a rock fight rushing like i think the rams have the worst rushing super bowl offense since like 1988 or something like the corpse of sunny michelle and uh cam Akers are not going to move the needle all that much so you don't have to worry about the Jarek mckinnon early early down stuff that you had to against the chiefs it looks like but i don't know like it's a three and a half point spread i think and that feels about right this feels like a toss-up to me like i could see it going either way i mean Bengals are my pick and I hope it's the Bengals. That's really lame if we get back to back home team winning yeah, in the home stadium. That. Yeah. And I mean, you're not biased either. So that's the important thing to mention here, too, is like not only would you hate that for the Los Angeles factor, but you would also hate it uh, not like just for that, but like not the not the Bengals stuff that uh, you cover quite well over there in Lockdown Bengals. But I do, I don't know. I'm just excited to see what this looks like. Like I'm excited to see what they throw at jamar chase if jamar chase can get relatively shut down in back-to-back -back games what burrow does with two weeks of preparation like the zach taylor sean McVay history like are they gonna overthink each other like we can't get away from these guys we got kyle shanahan McVay, lafleur zach taylor it's just they're everywhere i i just wonder on that front what two weeks of time who it benefits more but i don't know like are you what is your gut instinct right now when you found out when you watched the Rams Niners game after, do you want the Niners or are you happy with the Rams? I, I think that the Niners are a better matchup because Jimmy G yeah. is a worse quarterback than Matt Stafford, but and, you're getting the defensive line from San Francisco. You're getting, yeah, but they, they've seen it. They, they've True. dealt with the defensive line from San Francisco. True. And, and I know Eric Armstead's a really good player and Joey Bosa is a really good player, but Nick Bosa, my bad. I called him Joey Bosa on my show. Nick too. Bosa, yeah. Joey's I, the Chargers, yeah. The Bengals play both Bosa's. <laughs> so, there's just Bosa's everywhere. Th there's Bosa's everywhere. But, you know, Von Miller's found the fountain of youth in the playoffs. Yeah. And, and Aaron Donald is who he is. And Leonard Floyd, you, you can't forget about Leonard Floyd. Mm. Like, they have a great pass rush. They mm. do. I, I don't think that the is going to reveal itself as much. It, well, maybe it does like Aaron Donald's a freak, but like, I'm not as worried about sacks and pressures mm -hmm. as I'm worried about what it does to the Bengals offense schematically. Okay. Because of what we talked about earlier with the Titans, they just go into a shell. They don't throw deep at all. They don't throw intermediate very much. And Joe Burrow is deadly in the intermediate part of the field. And that's a big part of this offense when it works. But if you can't, they, they couldn't block a three shot drop last week mm -hmm. against Chris Jones, the, the, the right guard was on his butt before Joe Burrow could finish a three-step drop. Is that the one who got benched? 
one of y'all's well, right with so supposedly that was a planned rotation but both oh. both right so so what happened was it started with hakeem adenergy yeah and then he didn't have a very good game and then they put in <laughs> jackson carmen then he didn't have a very good game yeah and then they brought hakeem adenergy back in but then mm-hmm. i but then i realized in overtime it was back to jackson carmen so uh you know going through two options that weren't so good yeah at right guard and that is going to be what it is. And it's just like, how does the Bengals offense adapt? You got Jalen Ramsey out there. Mm-hmm. So probably the best corner they've seen all year. Maybe the best corner in the NFL. Certainly certainly in the conversation. And it's going to be how, how patient are the Rams. There's a pretty clear blueprint at this point. You know, rush four, drop seven, keep the ball in front of you, keep a safety over Jamar Chase. Mm-hmm. And... and you know, that that's what teams are doing to, to limit this offense. And when you can't block stuff up, that's sometimes pretty effective because you can't get yeah. those intermediate routes. You're stuck throwing slants and outs and sticks all day. And they've been able to do just enough, but I don't think the Bengals are really going to be able to run the ball in this game. Yeah. Um, but maybe they can. I don't know. Maybe they surprise I think other us. teams going to run the ball in this game. <laughs> They're well, going to try. Here, here's the thing about the Rams offense is, like they have an offensive line and maybe their mm-hmm. running backs haven't been playing very well. And Cam Akers didn't practice on Thursday. So we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on how healthy those running backs are too. But like, I don't think Lou Anarumo can just drop eight against Matt Stafford. Hmm. I, I don't think like the, he's not going to be able to do the same thing. So against Tennessee, there's a very clear like, game plan of like, okay, put a thousand pounds between the tackles, play bare fronts, mm-hmm. dedicate yourself to stopping Derrick Henry. And they do it against Kansas City, what mm-hmm. Lou Anarumo figures out as that game goes on is okay, we can't pass rush and we're gonna drop eight. We're gonna we're gonna bracket and pay extra attention. So Tyree Kill for the entire game. We're gonna drop the the guy off the defensive line on Travis Kelsey's side of the field and try to disrupt him off the line of scrimmage. I, I just think it's more complicated against against the Rams because Odell Beckham, you know, for whatever you want to say about him, is still probably a pretty good player. Cooper Cup is is very dangerous. And I think that Sean McVay is is just gonna present more multiple, more multifaceted challenges. Mm-hmm. Whereas against the Chiefs, it's very much like, okay, we don't give a shit if you run the ball. Mm-hmm. And and against the Titans, it's okay, Ryan Tannehill, good luck. And then they pick him off three times because Ryan Tannehill had a bad game. And so Lou Anarumo playing on these tendencies has come up with these really good game plans that have worked mm-hmm. the last couple of weeks. I just think that's a little bit harder against the Sean McVay team. And I know Andy Reid's a great coach, and I think the Tennessee offense is, is a solid offense, good play-action offense with Derrick Henry. Didn't work very well in that game, but it just I think it's harder to play on Sean McVay's tendencies, and I, I hope I'm wrong about this. I want to, I want Luana Rimo to figure it out again, right, and, and, and keep the game close because if the Bengals really go down and, mm. and their defense doesn't figure it out like they figured it out against the Chiefs, then against Aaron Donald and Von Miller and Leonard Floyd, then it gets ugly. And so you need to avoid that scenario. What is your gut telling you? What do you? How do you think this goes as of right now, late on a Thursday, February third? Yeah, you know Joe Burrow when he's a three and a half, three is it three point or worse uh-huh. underdog this year hasn't lost a game. Oh, I like that. I, I mean, for me, it's. It's well, Joe also Burrow. what? Only what? Six guys have won a national title, a Heisman, and a Super zero. Bowl. Zero. Oh, it's zero. zero. So guys. I guess a couple have won. The, the national and, championship in a Super Bowl and, and, is, or yeah. the Heisman in a Super Bowl. Right. Yeah. Okay. Tom Brady was talking to Joe Burrow on their podcast, mm-hmm. the Tom Brady podcast, and, and yeah. said, yeah, you'd be the first one to do it. You could do that and then retire. <laughs> he was joking. Uh, but, but you know, for, for me. I mean, you'll never top it. Like, uh, get your, like, your right. knees already messed up. Just walk yeah. out on top. It, there's nothing cooler than walking out on top. And he is Joe Cool. Uh, imagine doing that in your second year. That would be yeah. ins- like Andrew Luck, except you win the Super Bowl. And then yeah. you're like, all right, I'm good. Uh, Joe Burrow hasn't been as bad at as, as Andrew Luck. And, and here's the thing. If they like, if they win, mm-hmm. then you're probably talking about the start of a dynasty with the offseason resources they have, the ability to remake their offensive line this year. Mm-hmm. And, and just like how tight knit that team is. If they win, I think they, they would be able to run back a lot of the guys on the defensive side of the ball. Guys are going to want to come block for Joe Burrow. Guys are going to want to come play defense and get the ball back for Joe Burrow. Because mm-hmm. that's the kind of guy he is. That's the kind of pull he has in this league right now already. And that's the reason that some of these guys signed with the Bengals in the first place. So that's what it comes down to. 
what does my gut tell me is there's a lot of things in this matchup mm -hmm. that, that look like they should favor the Rams. There are a lot of things in the Kansas City matchup that look like they should favor the Chiefs. There are a lot of things in the Tennessee matchup that look like they should favor the Titans. There were a lot of things in Week 17 against the Chiefs that looked like they should favor the Chiefs. The Bengals won all those games. And Joe Burrow came up in the clutch in those games. And these guys have the clutch gene. Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Evan McPherson, they have the clutch gene, man. And, and I don't know if Matt Stafford does. He, he tried to throw a pick at the end of that game against the 49ers. <laughs> he tried. He tried his hardest. I'm not saying yeah. the Rams are a bad team. They're a great football team. Obviously, a great football team. Really well-rounded, built for this moment. But yeah, Joe Burrow or Matt Stafford, so much in the NFL comes down to the quarterback play. And I, I've said it all year, you know, doubt Joe Burrow at your own peril. And, and that's how I'm feeling right now. I like it. I like it. Well, we'll leave it there. Jake, what can we uh, look out from you and the good folks over there at uh, Lockdown Bengals and the Lockdown Network this week? Yeah, well, uh, on Sunday, I'm flying down to L.A. Okay. I'm going to be at uh, Radio Row for the week. So we'll be coming with Are you going a bunch to game? of... I don't know. It's looking unlikely, unfortunately, okay. because tickets cost $10,000. Oof. $6,000 on the Why can't we get you a media pass? Let's get. Let's make that happen. If you have that kind of pull, I, I gotta see. I'll, I'll see what I can do. The Chase <laughs> podcast, yeah. You never know the kind of pull we got pull, over there. Pull some strings for me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but but we'll be there for Radio Row from Monday to Friday at the very least. Mm -hmm. And my co-host James Rapine will be covering the game. He will be in the press box. He's been in the press box all year, so he'll be in the press box at SoFi. Currently, I'm thinking I'm gonna have to fly home on Saturday, okay, and uh, catch the game on Sunday from home. <laughs> interesting see like i'm not a press box guy at all like every ut game like i i don't like the press box i'll never go in one ever again like the entire point of me being there is to have fun and i yeah. just I don't understand the point of being like oh i'm gonna be way up in the air and around a bunch of other people that don't have any rooting interest yeah. and have no emotions about what's happening no why would i go to a sporting event and not be able to just uh totally be obnoxious and lose my voice that's the whole point point. And, and how uh, am i supposed to keep my myself together how am i supposed right. to keep my mentals together Exactly. Like you can lose yeah. it in your house. You're fine. Yeah. Like who cares? I mean, the thing is though, given the opportunity to be in the press box or watch it from home, I would yeah. take the press box. Interesting. I no, would decline. Yeah. I mean, it's a Super Bowl. I that, don't care. That, like I'm declining for me. Unless this, unless the press box is like on the field or it's like lower <laughs> left. Like if my press box, if they give me a field pass, like I would always take a field pass. Oh yeah. So that's cool. Like I did that a bunch in high school for like high school games. It's like, this is how you knew I was cool. Jake is like, the cool guys in high school, what they do is they don't go in the student section. No, what they do is they use their student newspaper sports editor pass <laughs> and go to the field and just walk the just literally walk the field and just be yeah. like taking notes and like, oh, left guard got blown up there and just jotting it down. Like that's what that's what's cool when you're 16. And that's what people really like is when you talk uh, critically about their football team at, at that age and your peers. So they, your they peers, that right. Yeah. They're, they're your friends walking around the halls with you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the cool thing, but I, I love that. Like if you give me field pass, I'll always do. Yeah. For always sure. do field pass. Um, well go subscribe locked on Bengals ahead of this week, uh, or I guess a week and a half before the Bengals fingers crossed beat the Los Angeles Rams and Joe Burrow gets his ring. It'd be a great story. I'm here for it. The city of, Cincinnati deserves it far more than the city of angels. I think we can all agree on that front. Jake, thank you so much for the time. Lockdown Bengals subscribe today. I will have to talk to you again soon. Appreciate it, man.